everybody. Um, today I'm uh, taking for Nicolas, which is uh, having fun uh, going to travel in the Negev, and so uh, left me in charge here. <laughs> uh, anyway, today we are switching uh, gears and coming back to Israel, where we are uh, happy to host uh, Simon Emmanuel, will be talking uh, with us about fracking under the microscope. Uh, Simon, in, Simon is a, as did is a BSc, MSc at the Hebrew U, uh, at the Hebrew University in Geology. Uh, then uh, went for his PhD at the uh, Institute of Weizmann and the postdoc at Yale. Um, he is now a professor at the Institute of Earth Sciences at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, with a group concentrating uh, on water-rock interaction related to hydrology and the uh, hydrocarbon reservoirs. Um, Simon is also the leader of a big uh, program that we have now with uh, a U.S.-Israel energy center that we got funded uh, recently. And that's another exciting uh, achievement, one of his many. And I think without uh, any delay, I'll pass the stage to Simon. Uh, now, uh, if you want to ask questions, please put it in the chat. At the end of the, the, end of the meeting, we will, uh, at the end of the meeting, we will uh, have some time for questions, direct questions and questions from the chat. Please, okay. Simon. Okay, so, the, so thank you, Itzik. It's a, it's a really, uh, you know, a nice opportunity to, to talk about my work always, and especially at Haifa, um, which I haven't been to for a while. So today we're actually, although I'm back in Israel, the topic is going to be based in America. Um, and you can see from the title, Fracking Under the Microscope, the focus today is going to be fracking. And you can actually see in the picture that I have in this slide here, in the opening slide, you can see an example of a, what's called a fracking pad. And in the background, you can see a rig where the hydrocarbons, where the oil and gas are, is, is extracted. But in the foreground, you can actually see a huge pool of water. And this water is used during the fracking process and it's stored in this pool. And what we're going to be doing today is focusing on the processes that affect the quality of this water. And we'll be talking about the scale of this problem. So we're really going to be talking a little bit about some of the controls, the environmental implications um, of fracking today. And the microscope part comes in in some of the tools that we use to analyze or look at this, look at this problem. So we're gonna be zooming in to the microscopic scale. So just before I start the talk, I'd like to say thank you. Um, and I'd like to, to give recognition to, to all the members of my group. This is a pre-COVID uh, picture, obviously. Um, and so some of, the, some of the people in this group contributed and are no longer in the group. Um, so there's a you know, big thank you to Han uh, Zhang, who, uh, who, was in, who was in the group and contributed much of what we're going to see. And then to the right is Evgeny Kreisman, who's uh, who, who did much of the initial work on this as well, you know, during his master's. Um, so just for those of you who are not familiar with what hydraulic fracturing is, I, it's not an exaggeration set to say that it really has revolutionized the global energy industry. And this is just over the last 10 years. So um, what does it actually do? Uh, in the first stage, you, water is injected from a water storage pond into the subsurface, and that depth can be several kilometers below the surface of the earth. And the target is usually shales. So low permeability shales, and the water is injected at high pressure, and that fractures the shales and increases the permeability of the shales and lets the uh, lets the gas actually seep out, or lets the oil and the gas seep out. The second stage is this water is then um, extracted, and it's called the flowback water, and it's again stored in the water storage pond. And this process, process can go backwards and forwards several times um, during, the, during the, the life cycle 
of a, uh, of a fracking pad. And at some stage, this water in the storage pond has to be treated and dealt with. So this process really has, has had a huge impact on the global energy uh, market. And what you can see here in this picture is an aerial picture of a region of Texas. And each one of these um, small, uh, uh, small uh, pads here is, a, is an individual drilling pad. And you can really see here the, the scale of the problem in this particular image. But it, it gets even worse when you zoom out and you, you get an idea of how large this, this problem is. And this is again um, a similar region in Texas where each one of those white dots there represents a drilling pad. Just to give you an idea, in the whole of the Mediterranean, in the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean, there are, you know, a, a couple of, there, were, there are fewer than two dozen pads. So this, just in this image here, we have more uh, drill, we have more drill or, or more drilling wells than we have in the whole of the Mediterranean. But that doesn't even stop there. If you look at the US in general, there are about half a million active wells. Half a million. That's a huge, huge, huge number. Um, How has it affected the United States and gas production? You can see here along the x-axis, we've just got the number, we've got the years going from 1990 projected into the future. Um, we've got the uh, production of trillion cubic feet along the y-axis. And you can see here that around about 2000 or uh, 2005, 2008, 2009, suddenly shale gas is increasing in terms of production. And that really has, has, it has turned you, the United States from a gas importer to a gas exporter. And that shale gas production, again, who knows what's going to happen in the future, but the projection, the, the idea is that this will uh, increase, uh, continue to increase into the future. It's actually had also a huge impact on the, on the price of oil and gas around the world. So you can see here, this is the cost of, of oil per barrel. Um, it's fluctuated, obviously, but the overall decrease there was starting around about 2014 is, is thought to be as a direct result of a glut in cheap oil and gas coming from fracking. So it's had a huge impact in the price. And in fact, it was summarized by, by The Economist uh, with this front page, um, where it basically pitted um, uh, Arab oil producers against American frackers. As, and this, is, this war basically was what uh, controlled oil price and gas price, at least during the, or, or caused the reduction in the price in, the two, in 2014. So, if we're looking at the United States, you can see here on this map, all the red regions are shale gas basins. So these are either active plays uh, or, or, or plays that are potential plays. And we've got in here uh, in, in uh, the Barnett and, Farmer and, and Barnett uh, and Barnett and Bossier and Woodford, the Marcellus, Mancos, Monterey. So people in, in oil and gas production, these are, these are very familiar and very famous names. Uh, at least now. So if we look on a global scale, you can see it's not just America that has potential oil and gas plays. Um, uh, Canada has been very active in production, South America, Europe. In fact, we're probably, probably the only place that doesn't really have high oil and or fracking potential, oil and gas potential from shales is, is, is in our region, in, is in a small corner of the world. Um, but out on a global scale, it's, it's a very, very, it's a potentially um, a huge uh, impact. And it already has had a huge impact. So one of the problems um, environmentally with hydraulic fracturing is that it uses vast quantities of water. Just to give you an idea of how much water oil and gas production in the United States uses, it's 2.1 or 200 billion cubic meters per year. And that's 10% of the total consumptive use of water in America. In terms of Israel, that's 100 times larger than the total annual, annual use of water in Israel. So it's, it's a potentially huge, huge, huge problem. And all this water 
has to be treated at some point. So one of the reasons, this is actually one of the reasons uh, um, that it's caused a huge public backlash. I'm sure many of you have seen videos of people turning on their taps in their homes and out coming water and then they're lighting the water with a match. So there was a huge, huge public outlet, uh, backlash when, when fracking first began. And the focus was often on methane and methane uh, uh, migration or the migration of hydrocarbons. Uh, but the problem is actually much worse than that. And, and it, this whole environmental problem has caused a huge, um, you, you know, huge uh, backlash around the, uh, in America and Europe. Um, frack is whack. Uh, with demonstrations, demonstrations like what the frack and my personal favorite, which is no fracking way. Um, and much of the, the, this is in some ways, many of these demonstrations, even if you're pro um, hydrocarbon and pro, pro fracking, many of these demonstrations were, were, were crucial in focusing on the actual problems and trying to understand the very real problems that fracking um, has. One of the things that came out when people started looking at the sources of uh, pollution and contamination associated with fracking is that much of it doesn't occur in the subsurface. Much of it actually occurs in, uh, on the surface with spillage uh, of the wastewater. And this is one of the things that, that we're going to look at, the quality of that wastewater and how it can be treated rather than, uh, uh, and after, it's, after, after we, we, we finished using it. So just before we talk about how uh, the process is affecting um, fracking, or the flow back water, let's talk about what's in there. So there are obviously the, hydro, the, the organics, there are the hydrocarbons, those are the phases that people were lighting in, in uh, their taps. But there are a lot of man-made chemicals that are injected during the fracking process as well, like biocides, for example, and propants, which keep the fractures open. There are also naturally occurring radioactive materials that come out uh, as a result of leaching or mixing with, with fluids in the, in, the, in the subsurface. There are halides, so we can get high levels of salinity, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And we can also get inorganic contaminants like ammonium, barium, selenium, um, arsenic. Okay, so there are all kinds of problems that come out in this, as a, it, it, or, or there are all kinds of uh, 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 co contaminants that come out with the flow back water. So basically the problem is this, we start out with water that looks relatively clean like this, and we end up with water that looks like that. So this water has to be treated. We're not going to be focusing on the treatment of this water um, today, we're going to be focusing on the processes that cause the contamination in the first place. One of the things, one of the reasons that this has become such a pressing problem is that uh, disposal was the first strategy used during wastewater uh, management. So basically you would finish the extraction process, you would then put the water in some kind of, in a truck or something, and you would ship it to a disposal well, and you would inject it into the subsurface. And this was the most popular way of treating or not treating the wastewater, just simply disposing of it in the subsurface. And the reason that this was so popular is that it was very, very cheap. It was the cheapest um, way of getting rid of the, the, the wastewater. The problem is, is that this process caused um, a huge number of minor earthquakes in the states uh, where they, they had focused and, and used this method for disposing of wastewater. You can see here a map of all the earthquakes prior to see that they're dotted all over the United States. And then after 2008 and around about 2009, you can see that there's really a, um, a swarm of earthquakes in Oklahoma, for example. And this is one of the, the reason that Oklahoma was one of the, one of the main uh, focuses of these swarm of, of earthquakes was because this was where the injection wells, many of the local injection wells were. Um, and again, I'm not going to go into, this, into the uh, uh, geophysics of it, but there's fairly, there's now a, a, an almost total agreement that this size, this injection process of wastewater um, 
is what caused the in increased seismic activity, at least in Oklahoma. Um, and as a result of all these minor um, earthquakes, there was a lot of pressure, and there is a lot of pressure on producers in America now to treat the water. So treatment of flowback water has become a real necessity in the US. We can't just dispose of it in the, in the subsurface. Um, and one of the things when people started asking about how to treat, the, how to treat the, this water, one of the first questions that, that they wanted to know was, what are the factors controlling the quality of the flowback water? In any given, um, in any given uh, uh, oil or gas play, how can I know what the quality of the water is that I'm going to get? How can I predict it? Um, and that may help me uh, 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 make the process of treating it cheaper. So this is the main motivation for understanding the processes that are going on and what's causing the, um, or the reduction in quality of the flowback water. The question that we're going to look at today is, is much, much more focused than that. It's how does, how does water, how do world water shale interactions affect water quality? And that's really the focus of my research, which deals with uh, water rock interactions. And uh, this is the real question that we're going to look at today. So when we look at any water rock interaction process, we, we often have uh, chemical processes that are occurring. So we can have desorption or absorption onto the surface of mineral, onto the surface of the minerals in the rock. And we can also have mineral dissolution. So we can have minerals actually dissolving from the rock uh, and re-precipitating as well, sometimes in the pipeline, sometimes in the fractures. And all these processes can release contaminants or control the way contaminants are mobilized in that, in, 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 uh, the, during the water rock interaction. There's another thing as well that, can, that is often overlooked and can be just as important, and that's the release of colloidal particles. And what happens when colloids, very small particles, are chipped off the rock, if you like, or are released from the rock, they can act as uh, vectors for the transport of contaminants. So often when we look at geochemical processes, we're just focusing on dissolution and precipitation and sorption and desorption. Uh, but often we forget that there are other processes like, the, like, like particulate mobilization, which can also control uh, the processes. So just to give you, for those of you who aren't geologists or hardcore geologists, just to remind you, uh, shales are the most abundant sedimentary rock on Earth. They represent over 60% of all sedimentary rocks. And what you can see here is a typical uh, gray shale, which, has, uh, um, which is rich in organic matter. We know automatically that it's rich in organic, in organic matter because it's gray. Um, and when you look at shales from a hand sample, they don't look very inspiring and they don't look very interesting and they, they actually look very homogeneous. Um, and one of the things is, is that I find fascinating with shales is that, is that when you look at them under the microscope, things change. Um, you, you see a completely different world. So what you can see here is an image uh, taken with a scanning electron microscope. Um, and this is a backscattered uh, image. And you can see here that there are a few different phases in that image. Um, but it all, all becomes more apparent when we actually start mapping the, the, the minerals in that, in that image or in that picture. And you can see here that although the scale here is about the, the, the X along the, in the X direction, we've got about 50 microns, which is really small. We can see that the number of different phases is really quite large. So we have quite a lot of clay. Calcite is very common. Uh, we have quartz, uh, plagioclase, pyrite, titanium oxide. Um, we have a, a huge number of, of phases. We also have an organic phase as well. So these different, we can see that in a really small region, we have quite a heterogeneous mineralogy, and this is quite typical of shales. Um, and it also, and what this does is it makes predicting it, the geochemistry and how it's going to react with water, it makes it much, much more complicated. One of the things that we're going to focus on in this uh, talk is pyrite. Uh, pyrite, you can see here, um, what are called pyrite framboids. 
uh, they're embedded in uh, um, in a mic in a nanofossil. And pyrite is a major environmental hazard, hazard, and in many shales it can be several percent by weight. So it's quite a, an important component in many shales. What pyrite is, for those of you who don't remember mineralogy, it's, a, it's an iron sulfide. It's also known as fool's gold. And what it does is it contains often um, a lot of uh, high concentrations of arsenic, high concentrations of heavy metals, and it's a major pollutant. Um, it's a, it's a real problem, not just in fracking, it's a problem um, in, in any, often in, mine, uh, in mines where, where shales or, or pyrite comes into contact with, with oxygen and it becomes oxidized. So the process that, that we're looking at is this, these, these pyrite framboids or these pyrite particles, uh, and they're reacting with oxygen. Okay, and they can uh, cause iron oxide to be uh, precipitated out. You also notice that in this process, we get sulfuric acid forming. Um, this whole process during the dissolution of iron sulfide, we can liberate uh, um, uh, inorganic contaminants like arsenic, and we can also cause acidification of the water. So this whole process is a major uh, environmental problem in the world, uh, in, in any region that has, or many regions that are uh, affected by mining. So acid mine drainage, when we talk about acid mine drainage, this is the process that causes acid mine, uh, acid, acid mine drainage. Um, so pyrite in water is generally not a good thing. So the question that we started this whole research with uh, was, are pyrite particles mobilized during shell water interaction? Okay, so are these particles that we see, are they liberated during, uh, during, water, uh, during the interaction with fracking fluid. So we started out with a simple uh, um, uh, experiment where we were pumping fluid into a reaction cell which contained shale. Um, and we were uh, looking at the surface of that shale before and after reaction. So we were using electron microscopy to look at the surface before and after reaction. And we did this over a whole range of pHs and temperatures, um, salinities, and fl and, but we kept the flow rate fairly standard. So this is an example of the Eagleford Shale, which is one of the big uh, plays from Texas. And you can see here, uh, we have uh, this nanofossil, it's a, um, it's a foram, and it's made of calcite. And you can see four different pyrite framboids embedded within that nanofossil. And this image is taken before reaction. And then you can see after reaction, much of the calcite in the nanofossil has dissolved and all those pyrite framboids have, have disappeared. Okay, we have others that have been exposed, but those four have actually completely disappeared. Um, one of the things that we did was that we used image analysis to identify and quantify this process. So you can see here, uh, we've identified in this image two uh, um, pyrite particles that are, have been released during, the, during water rock interaction. And the idea was to, was to get enough of, these, enough of these images to get some kind of statistical idea. So this is just an image or a, or a, or a combined image of the surface of, of a shale. Um, and the idea was that we were looking over very, very large regions of this shale and then identifying um, the particles that have been removed. Now, obviously, we couldn't do this um, manually. We had to do this automatically. And we developed software that would identify which particles had been removed as a result of, as a result of water, rock in, water rock interaction. And that really allowed us to build up some kind of or quantify this process. Um, so this is an example from the first series of experiments that we did. And you can see here along the, the x-axis, we have the particle, we have particle diameter. We have along the y-axis, we have the number of detachment events. So we're talking in the, in the region of hundreds of events during these experiments. So there is some statistical basis for what we're doing. Um, it's not just individual particles that we're, that we're looking at. Um, 
To make sure that what we were looking at was not dissolution, we used atomic force microscopy. And what, my, what atomic force microscopy does is it allows us to track the topography of the shale during the, inter in, during the fluid uh, rock interaction. So we're not stopping the experiment, we're, we're imaging the surface um, throughout the experiment. And this is an SEM image before of a particular region on, that, on, the sh on a shale surface. And you can see here that there are two, um, there are two pyrite particles. There's one in the center, or there are actually three. And there's one in the center and there's one to the left, which is surrounded by a red dot. And you can see after fluid rock interaction that we've imaged again using SEM, it's gone. During this experiment, we imaged it continuously during uh, using AFM. So we actually had of that same region that was being imaged using AFM. You can see the partic particle in the bottom left. Um, and this is one image taken during the experiment. And then this is that same region that was imaged five minutes later. So there's just five minutes between those two images there. And you can see that the particle, the particle is gone. What you're looking at is actually a topographic map of the surface. And we can see that in it, instead of the particle, we have a hole. Um, what this tells us is that it's not dissolution. What this tells us is that the particle is being physically removed from the surface. So what we, th this is really an important, uh, um, uh, important pro or important thing to realize is that we're not talking about a chemical reaction. So if we had a, a chemical model that would predict what was going on, it wouldn't tell us that the release of particulate matter was one of the, one of the processes going on. So just to summarize those, uh, the kinds of things that we're looking at, uh, we looked at the effect of pH. There wasn't a huge impact. What you can see here is that there's a huge variability from experiment to experiment. Um, the reason is, is that uh, probably there's the, just the, it's very difficult to get a representative surface on these, on these, shale, on these shales. Um, again, salinity didn't seem to have a, a big effect. And the temperature, again, there's no clear correlation or no clear um, uh, um, connection between the two. I would say that we haven't yet finalized that idea yet. pH, I still would expect pH to have an important effect, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but I think one of the problems is, is using a, a, the, the, this technique, it's difficult to get a representative uh, surface. So just to give you an idea of the, the, the scale of the problem, um, the average pyrite detachment rate is this number here, which doesn't mean very much. Um, it's 6.5 times 10 to the minus 11 moles per square meter per second. But if you compare it to the rate of pyrite oxidation, that rate is 10 times greater. So this process is potentially releasing 10 times more pyrite than would be released by just a chemical reaction. So it's potentially a very important process in determining the quality of the, of the water coming out. So we published this uh, two years ago in, in, in es and um, And one of the things that we, that we wanted to really focus on here was, was the mechanism. And after we, we published that, we wanted to really look at the mechanism. So one of the things we noticed during that first study was that all the, virtually all the pyrite that was being mobilized was surrounded by calcite. And what this meant, what we, what we believed to be happening was, was that the, the calcite was dissolving and it was allowing these particles to actually be released during the dissolution. So one of the things we, 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 we saw this when we actually used FIB um, to look at the section, look at the surface or a cross section of the surface before and after reaction. So what you can see here is along the x-axis, that's the x-direction, and along the y-axis, that's actually depth into the, into the shale surface. You can see here the, the shale framboids, you can see the, the calcite, the porosity of the dark regions. And you can see what it looks like after. So this isn't exactly the same region, but it's a similar region on the surface. And what we can see here is that there's much, much more porosity much of the calcite has been dissolved and the gray, these gray regions, um, these, kind of, these light gray regions of the shale are the, are the pyrite framboids. Um, so what we, what we saw is that 
In going into the surface of the shale, it becomes much more porous, much of the calcite has dissolved, and this would, this would uh, seem to support this idea of calcite dissolution and pyrite mobilization. So the hypothesis was that, was that we had was that if we have more carbonate in our shale, we should get more pyrite released. And this was the idea that we wanted to test. So we went and we gathered a whole bunch of different shales from mainly from America, but also um, uh, from Israel. So we have Arab, as well as Barnett and Eagleford. And what you can see here in this triangle is, is a composition triangle. So we have um, along, one of, the, along one, of, one of the sides, we have clay minerals, and we have carbonate minerals going along the left-hand side. And you can see here that we go from uh, rocks that have virtually no carbonate in them, like in the Barnett shale, to rocks that have very, very high concentration of carbonate, like in uh, well, from Israel. Um, and so we have quite a range of carbonate contents here. And the idea, again, was just to see whether or not there would be any correlation between um, the, amount of the amount of pyrite being released. So this is just um, a, 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 the a kind of summary. Um, you can see along the x-axis we have the calcite, and that's the weight of calcite taken from XRD. We then have a detachment probability. So here is, it's normalized to the amount of pyrite in the rock. So uh, it, it, what it's saying is here is that 0.1 would be 10% likelihood of a pyrite particle being released. Uh, 0 0.01 would be a 1% uh, likelihood of that, part, of that pyrite particle being released, etc. Okay, so it's normalized to the amount of pyrite. And what we can see if, we, if we, we, we were being generous is we can see some kind of correlation. It's, not, it's really not a very strong correlation but there does seem to be some impact of calcite uh, or increasing proportion of calcite. Again, we have a high level of um, heterogeneity or, 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 rare or between experiments, and this might be what's making this correlation harder to see. Um, if we compare it to the proportion of quartz, which in some of the rocks went from a couple of percent all the way up to almost 50%, you can see there doesn't, there, there, if anything, there seems to be some kind of anti-correlation, but there certainly doesn't seem to be any strong correlation um, between, between these two parameters, um, which, would be, which would be what we would expect. Quartz is a very inert mineral. It doesn't react with a fluid, um, at least on the timescales that we're talking about. So we wouldn't really expect any, any relationship between the two. Um, this was a little, I must say, if we go back to this image here of, of calcite versus detachment probability, it's quite a disappointing result. We had a hypothesis. It didn't seem to work as well as we expected it to work. So why, why, what other factors might affect the pyrite release? And this is really what got us thinking about other things. Maybe it's not just an issue of um, calcite dissolution and pyrite mobilization. Maybe there are other physical and chemical factors that are influencing this result. And the thing that we started thinking about was organic matter. So all these rocks contain a significant amount of organic matter. Um, they, many of them contain both bitumen as well as kerogen. And bitumen is quite a sticky substance. It's a quite, it often is thought of in some ways as, a, as an adhesive, keeping those particles in the shale together. Maybe one of the reasons as well that we didn't see much in the way of mobilization of uh, clay, uh, clay minerals, which we would have expected to be mobilized as well. So we can actually see here, going back to that experiment that I showed you with the AFM, we can see here uh, the organic matter surrounding that pyrite framboid in the center there. There's no organic matter in the particle that's been released. Or, okay, and we can see, this is, this is something that we see again and again in the experiments that we did. Particles that were surrounded by calcite were not mobilized, but particles that were surrounded by organic matter, um, uh, sorry, cal particles that were surrounded by calcite were not mobilized, were mobilized, but particles that were surrounded by the organic matter seemed to be embedded um, and, and weren't going anywhere. And that's exactly what you can see in this image here. Those two particles in the center basically seem to be embedded in some, in some kind of organic matrix. 
And it's that, this sticky matrix which is probably complicating um, the issue. So again, what we seem, if we're going to summarize here, we seem to be having, we seem, we probably have two processes going on. We have the dissolution of minerals, which is mobilizing particles. And then we have organic matter, which is probably um, uh, fixing those particles in place. So it's, we've got two, um, uh, uh, or, uh, or two processes that are working against each other. And so making any kind of prediction here uh, is going to require knowledge about the interaction of the organic matter with, with, these, with these particles. So if we're going to zoom out, let's go back to the implication of, or the implications that this finding has for the quality of groundwater, or sorry, the quality of flowback water and treatment, which was the initial motivation for this study. Um, if we're looking at this process, we can actually imagine that during water rock interaction, these pyrite particles are being mobilized into the fracture network and into the fluid phase. And when we're withdrawing the fluid phase and putting it in our storage pond, we can imagine that these particles are also going to come, they're going to come with us or they're going to be, they're going to come, they're going to accompany the mobile phase. Now that's probably not such a huge deal at depth, but the moment that this water is sitting in a pond um, at the surface and is exposed to oxygen, we can imagine that this process, this um, oxidation of pyrite, is going, to, is going to potentially be a problematic process. And as I said, this, uh, this, this uh, pyrite oxidation produces sulfuric acid, so we're going to have high acidity in the water, and we can also have the mobilization of um, contaminants such as arsenic. Um, and one of the things when we look at, when we look at uh, 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 fracking fluids, they often have a high, uh, high, high arsenic uh, uh, concentration as well as other heavy metals. So they're already starting with a, with a bad bunch and maybe, um, maybe this process is going to make it even worse whilst the fluid is in the fracking pond. Okay, so the idea is that if these particles, if these pyrite particles are making it into the fracking pools, um, that whole process could uh, um, release heavy metals, it could cause acidification, and it will reduce the quality of, um, of the water. But it may also mean that we can't re-inject that fluid at a later stage. So there are a whole, potentially, there are a whole bunch of implications for this process. Um, so one of the questions that we still haven't answered yet is how mobile are the released particles? Um, we know that they're probably being released, but they're also very dense particles and we don't know whether they're, whether they're actually being, they're making it all the way to the surface or they're being somehow filtered out by the fracture network. So this is an open question. So to say that we definitely have shown that this is an important process in the frack, in frack, during fracking, I mean, we're not quite there yet. Um, and this question of, of mobilization of the particles really is, 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 a, is, is a crucial, is a key one. So if we're going to just conclude here, um, I, I think it's fair, I think it would be, it would be we can, we can summarize simply by saying that particles are mobilized during shell water interaction, particularly pyrite particles. And um, those pyrite particles could end up in the flowback water. And that may potentially change the quality of the flowback water, not just as it comes out of the ground, but also as it's sitting in the storage pools at the surface. Um, Shell composition is probably going to play a crucial role in controlling the mobility of the particles. So it's not just the amount of calcite, it's probably the amount of organic matter and its level of maturation, for example. So if we have more bitumen, we may end up with the, more, with the particles being, being held more, more, more strongly by the shell. And I think uh, with that, uh, I think I've finished. So, um, I think we'll, we've got some time for some questions. So I think I'll just. Okay, hi, um, Simon. Thank you very much uh, for an interesting talk. 
there is one question by uh, Lana, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure I understand. Why does USA dispose water after AG, HGP instead of burning it? I'm yeah, sure. after hydraulic fracturing. Because I know that uh, some companies do this. So the water contains some, of, some part of hydrocarbons and the other water is just... Okay, so, so I, I think um, that flaring but I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, so, but I don't want to get flaring, it's a different issue. It's nothing to do with water quality. Um, as far as I know, maybe that's a process. I'm not familiar with, with burning. Burning will only get rid of hydro, hydrocarbons. It's not going to get rid of um, um, other, it's not going to get rid of inorganic contaminants and a whole, whole range of problems that, that we have. So, the flaring is, it, the flaring is more of a production issue rather than a water quality issue, as far as I know. Um, again, it's, it, there, are, there are ways of treating um, wastewater. And in fact, that's what most people do. The thing is in America, it, the, the quality varies from place to place, depending on the, on the shale, um, that you're, that, the target shale. The level of treatment required by law changes from place to place okay because it depends per on per state um and so all these things are, are basically you the the main challenge at the moment is to reduce the cost of the water treatment you can take any water that you have and you can make it into distilled water just by heating it but the idea is to is to reduce the cost of the of the of, of the treatment process, and that's the main challenge for for water for people dealing with water disposal or water treatment today in America. Is and and one yeah. of the things that people are going in is this kind of modular treatment on site rather than just shipping it to a central central area. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to ask. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe you mentioned it, but uh, you said that people are protesting against using the water like you use our water, but for example, do you have some um, water layers like above the exact shale? So you can, for example, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, so I think if you're talking about the impact on groundwater, are you talking about groundwater? Um, um, kind of maybe groundwater, but maybe some deposits, for example, like maybe oil or gas migrated somewhere and there are still water deposits underneath. So, so, so on different layers for cinnamonium yes. deposits or anything like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so I, I think so. So, so people were, were, were complaining about two major issues, water, of contaminating, of, of water, being, water in the subsurface being contaminated. So shallow aquifers were being contaminated during this process. Um, one of the things that, that uh, made this, you, you saw the scale of the problem, there are 500,000 wells. It only takes a very, very small proportion of them to be problematic for it to reach, you know, it sounds like it's a huge, huge, huge problem. So imagine you've got, you know, one in a thousand, 500 wells are problematic in the United States, but it, it sounds very, very bad. Now, during this process, one of the questions that, that it, people assumed what was happening was that the fractures were somehow reaching the shallow aquifers or something like that. That's actually been proven to be not correct at all. So there's no- It sounds ridiculous because you developed the field like at like two kilometers or one kilometer and a half and the fracture is not that big that you can like touch the ground waters. Yeah, yeah so the, fra the fractures don't reach, but this was one of the fears in the yeah. beginning of reaching. That, that's not a problem. One of the ways, so as I said, one of the main problems is spillage on the surface. Another problem is the mm -hmm. well often not connected properly. And that can cause subsurface leakage into shallow aquifers. Um, that's a problem often, the, it's often associated with small producers. Okay, so, um, you know, the big companies like to blame the small producers and say they don't know what they're doing. They're not, they're not fixing the well casings properly together. Um, but yeah, th that, those are the two main, those are the two, me the two main mechanisms for, mm -hmm. for, for shallow aquifers being, um, for being polluted and contaminated. 
Thank you. Any more questions, anybody? Yes, Gabriel. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, make reference back to the uh, shallow aquifers that you are talking about. Uh, because I think this same problem was actually being discussed uh, about two weeks ago in Nigeria too, because we have some uh, some drilling at the south south end. But then the, the question is this: you are talking about uh, the the water problem. Uh, uh, is it not possible that, uh, considering the fact that quite uh, a huge ton of water is being used? Uh, the process of getting this water out of the the shallow aquifer, which most of this water, maybe seventy percent, are also used domestically. Uh, can't the the big oil company uh, channel their water from the coast of Texas for those ones that are close to the Texas uh, zone? Oh. And, uh, so it's a, it's a good question. Um, one of the problems with using you're asking about using seawater. Yeah. Okay, so one of the problems with using seawater is that it contains a lot of dissolved minerals, which can cause problem, problems with casings, and, and that, that's, a, that's a huge problem in, its, in and of its own right. So that's one of the reasons that the water in the, sh in the uh, pools can't be reused over and over and over again, because they're dissolving minerals, they're bringing up a lot of dissolved um, minerals. And at some point, the quality of the water just isn't good enough. So salinity, if, we, if they were to bring in uh, seawater, I, I, I'm sure they've done it, okay? I'm sure that it's been tried, but I imagine that, um, that it, it, it's very problematic. So the reason what happens in, a, in, in America, one of the interesting things is in, in America is that um, the new, the, the people getting rich from, this, from fracking, it's not from selling the oil, it's from selling the water on their land oil producers. Wow. That's actually one of the, that these are the new kind of water barons. It's, it's much cheaper for, for, for these oil companies to buy the water off whatever farm they're on. And, and they use that for production. So that, that's, that, you know, these farmers who aren't making very much money are very, very happy about this, this arrangement. But they're making more money off selling the water than they are off the gas and the oil. Okay, because I, I'm sorry, let me add this, because I have a feeling, uh, if you consider the hydraulic movement of water within the soft surface, uh, usually when there's a vacuum, water will fill in. Now, if we have some aquifers that are shallow, in quotes, and when, uh, of course, they, they, they eject the water, definitely even the pool at the surface, there may be some seepage, some, maybe few percentage. Again, that's one, maybe a cost, but I also have a problem with the flow back water system. I don't think it can be 100% watertight compartment in the sense that well, at the shallow end, there may be some leakages too, maybe. There's probably, look, the, the, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's, there's been quite a lot of work on, on looking at the mechanisms and the pathways for contamination. And as I said, the, the scale there is so big, it doesn't take very, you know, all it takes is one in a thousand wells where they cut corners and you've got quite a large problem. Oh, okay. The other, going back to this issue of seawater, um, even if you were to just use seawater, imagine that, you know, it does work. You're still bringing on that huge amount of seawater to the, to, on, you know, to the interior, to the, to the, and that has to be treated at some point. Does, you're, not getting, you, you're not getting around the, way, the, nece the necessity to treat the water at some point. So there's no, there's no free lunch just by using seawater, even if it was possible. That's okay. um, so again, I, I'm fairly sure that, that it's been tested. My, my main I, my feeling is, is probably that basically causes the systems to basically shut down due to the uh, precipitation of minerals. But, but it, you know, and, and it must be a cost issue simply. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I'd like to actually go back to your uh, work and, uh, well, the most battlesome 
In your work, the, the most bothersome uh, issue is really that uh, you show these fantastic images of the of the pyrite disappearing with the calcite, and yet, uh, to be frank, the the graphs that you show of the pyrite and calcite co uh, correlation are not very uh, are not very extremely clear. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, share, I'll, I'll share my screen again, and we'll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I admit, you know, that was a big. Um, you know, here if we look at this one. Which one we look at all of them? No, 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 not the pH. The ones that uh, they correlate to. The, oh, this one. With the, yeah, the yeah. They, okay, so. Uh, I'll actually start with the pH and then and then uh, and and then I think that this is firstly I think okay firstly with these we go back so here we were expecting there to be quite a strong correlation between a pH that's why we try pH um, one of the problems here is that it's not normalized to the amount of pyrite in each image. So it's much harder to do uh, a comparison. We, we should have done that for this. But either way, there's not a strong correlation. I think one of the reasons, I think the main reason is, is that these shale surfaces, if you look, you know, we're only imaging a millimeter of shale in each experiment, which is, you know, what's a, what's a representative elemental volume for shale? You know, certainly, probably more than that. Probably a couple of millimeters, um, particularly if they're if they're laminated. Um, so we might get quite a level of heterogeneity from one image to the other. Here, though, we did take into account the amount of pyrite there was in an image. So yeah, we were very disappointed. Um, but I suppose it's like most geological things. You know, go look for a correlation in any geochemistry, uh, geochemical experiment, or um, and there isn't a very strong correlation. Okay, so it's certainly, and part of that is you can see the range um, of the range within each experiment, which is quite large. I think, you know, there's an order of magnitude within each experiment, um, which is just simply the heterogeneity of the system. I, we do think that there's this issue of the organic matter, which will act in a in a counterintuitive way so you've got two variables both the amount of calcite and the amount of bitumen for example and those two are going to be cru equally crucial and because they're working in different directions you're going to get you, you know you're, you're going to get a very a relatively poor um uh, a poor correlation these samples have different amounts of kerogen they have different amounts of bitumen so if this is a mechanism, which it, which it probably is, and as I say, we, we see it actually occurring. We see these particles that are embedded in the, in the bitumen, okay? And we see that they're not going anywhere. So again, it's a kind of, it's an explanation. It's, it just means that the real world is more complicated than we thought it was really. So, um, you know, this, yeah. this is the next step is to focus on, the, on, the, on, on this bitumen. I, I am. Uh, what I wanted to, to, to say was that probably th that it looks, it smells like there is more, there are more participants that need to be expressed in the graph. For example, in, in your graph, you could express uh, maybe a, a, the color uh, may, may, may reflect the amount of a uh, pyrite initially in the, in the sample or something like that. And like, you need to get to yeah, higher well, level graphs, I think. The, the next, the next step, really, and this is where we ran out of money. The next step was was to, um, the, the next step was basically to characterize the, the the organic matter in these in these samples, and see and run these experiments again and see if we could actually see some kind of correlation between the maturity of the samples, the amount of kerogen, the amount of bitumen, and those kinds of things. So. This was the, you know, it, it's, this is where the project met real life. Um, and, but, but we definitely, you know, I, th I think it's not as simple as we, we thought initially. Um, but, you know, life never is really. So. 
another question, assuming that, uh, that you actually managed to do it and, uh, and everything works fine, uh, do you have an idea what can be done about it? Well, I mean, I think, firstly, but I, I'm not really, I don't really- I mean in the, in the drilling situation, what yeah, can so they I, do? I don't really, it, all, it, all it does is provide you with, firstly, it means that you may have to filter the water coming back out. Okay, usually they might filter the water going in, but they're not necessarily filtering the water coming out. So that would be a simple, by the way, simple it's not because again, these are very small particle, particulate matter. And to filter that is again, expensive, but that may be one thing, for example, that, that, they, that you might want to do. Um, again, it's all a matter of cost. Is it, is it worth their while? Is it not worth their while? Um, but that would be one thing, assuming that these, these particles are going to, you know, at the moment they might not care about these particles because they just say, okay, we're filtering it as it goes back in, so I don't need to filter it as it, as it goes into the pool. So that, that might be one, one thing, for example. Okay, thank you. Anybody wants to ask any more questions? Okay, then I'll, I'll thank you, uh, Simon. I'm sure that uh, anybody else that wants to ask questions uh, can, uh, can uh, get to Simon. Um, and uh, thank you for appearing here. I know that Nicholas gives a preview of the next uh, week every time, but I don't have that preview. He just disappeared at the last moment notice uh, into the desert and so uh, we'll, we'll have to be curious, uh, curious and see where it, he, he gets to. And uh, Simon, we every, every week, the reason I said we're back to Israel is that every week he brings uh, people from another country. Oh, nice. He's been traveling to different countries. And this time it's Israel. I'm not sure what is the next, but uh, you're invited, of course, to I will, I will, follow I will. the link. And, uh, and uh, if you want, we, we can send you some information. Oh, definitely. I would, I would love to be. I would love to be uh, on on the mailing list for that. Excellent. So anyway, th thank you, Sig. It's been. Uh, it's, it's, and if anyone would like, wants to contact me and ask further questions, um, I'm more than happy to. Okay. Great. Thank okay. you. Bye. Itzik. Bye. <laughs> thank you.